If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 23. Luke 23. Again, if you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1124. Luke 23. Imagine the scene with me. Perhaps you're out walking on a late morning with your children. You've decided to walk outside the walls of Jerusalem, and you have them by the hand, and as you're walking along that ancient city, and as you're reflecting on the beauty and the wonder of the life that you live in the city that is called the City of Peace, you round the corner of the city wall, and there is Skull Hill in front of you. And there on Skull Hill, to your surprise, on the top of the hill, there's a crowd gathered, a crowd down below the hill. And you can see, and you try to shade the eyes of your children because you can see three crosses. And on those crosses, you see three men in unspeakable torture. You've never seen a crucifixion, but you've heard about it. You know that this is the way the Romans punish publicly as a deterrent the worst of criminals, at least those who are not Roman citizens. And you hate Rome and all that Rome represents, and here you see Rome in all her gory, bloodlust power, as you see three bodies hanging on crosses, bleeding, suffering, and dying. That's the scene that would have greeted you 2,000 years ago, just outside the city walls of Jerusalem and Palestine. And this is what happened in Luke chapter 23, as we begin in verse 39, for our consideration this afternoon. Many other things took place on that hill that day, but I want to draw your attention to those three crosses Verse 39 says, one of the criminals who were hanging railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Three men in unspeakable torture. The horror of crucifixion. The intention is to kill by pain and suffering. Typically, death was by asphyxiation because the victim could no longer push up and catch a breath as he hung on that cross. And each of these three would soon be a corpse. And as you're walking outside the city of Jerusalem that day and you look up at those crosses, the appearance, apparently, they are all the same. And you would be justified in going home and describing this to your family, to your neighbors, as three worthless, evil, wretched rebels and criminals were crucified today. Because by appearance, they all look the same. But in reality, they were much, very much different from one another. And though all of this is so far removed from your life and mine today, let me propose something to you. There's a sense in which we were there too. There's a sense in which we were on one of those crosses. Think about the first cross. Let's call him the sinner. This is the one who was railing and mocking Jesus on the middle cross. The Bible calls him a criminal. The idea is he was a thief. He was a a robber. Let's ask the question, where did he come from? Well, we know his race because he came from the human race. You recognize that's really the only race there is. 
He was of the human race, and therefore he was made in the image of God. And though that image in every human is drastically distorted, every person still bears that image. He is made in the image of God. And thus, at the very least, we can say he is responsible before God. And God had revealed his truth to him in creation and in his heart, in knowledge, and he was guilty. He was responsible. The assumption is he was Jewish because he uses Jewish language here. He has some exposure to the idea of a Messiah, a one who would come and that the, the God of Israel would send to deliver his people. The sinner had some sense of that because he uses that language to mock this one on the middle cross. That's where he came from. How did he get here? How did he get on the cross? Well, we don't know the specifics. We do know the terms that are used. He was a criminal. Uh, another text says he was a violent robber. Very likely, because of the, of the terror of this execution, he was an insurrectionist like another fellow named Barabbas, who had, by incredible circumstances, had been released so that the man on the middle cross would die. And certainly if he was an insurrectionist, he was under Rome's judgment, but also make no mistake, what we know is that he was also under God's judgment. How does he invest his final moments? Well, the text tells us he reviled and mocked Jesus. That's how he invested his dying energy. In his dying energy, he turned to this rabbi from Nazareth and mocked him and, and blasphemed him. That's how he got there. He's the sinner. And where was he headed? Well, his body, unlike, un, undoubtedly, was headed for a pauper's grave. He was likely on his own. No one would likely claim him. He was surely going to be buried in a pauper's grave, if even that. But his soul, his soul was headed to torment, the Bible tells us. This was the expectation of what we call the Old Testament. It's also the teaching of Jesus. When one dies in their guilt and in their sin, according to the story or parable, take your pick, but the story or parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16, immediately when one dies, if one dies in their guilt, they experience the torment of God's judgment. That's where he was headed. And so even though his body would likely go into a pauper's grave, that's not the end of his body either because the Bible tells us that one day the God of creation who cares about this world and cares about bodies will one day resurrect that body. It will be rejoined with that soul who is under judgment and then will experience what the Bible calls a terrifying phrase, eternal death, unending death. That's his destiny. That's the destiny of the sinner. And could I just point out for you today, just by way of passing, that there is never any ultimate injustice with God. A whole lot of things happen in this world, and it appears like people get away with it. A whole lot of people, it seems like in one way or another, because of their, their wealth or because of the faultiness of our judicial systems, they seem to get away with far too much. But let me remind you, God is the ultimate judge. This one who is a sinner is at this moment, his soul is in torment, and one day his soul will be reunited with a resurrected body, and that body will suffer eternally. That's the sinner. Well, what about the Savior? We say that he's on the middle cross. What about him? He's just a lowly, marginalized rabbi from Galilee. Where did he come from? Well, he also came from the human race. His humanity was real and full. We would argue he was the most fully human person that has lived since Adam and Eve. But that's not all. He was not only human, but the Bible tells us he was divine. He was man, but he was also God, and as such, he was eternal. In his divine nature, he had existed before time and before creation, and obviously he, joined now with a human nature, will exist eternally as well. This is the mystery, and we acknowledge it's a great mystery. It's the mystery of the incarnation. 
But when we think about where he came from, we need to think about his life and what he did not do, and we know the Bible tells us what he did not do is he did not sin. That in and of itself makes him the most astonishing person in history. Well, we also need to recognize what he did do, because the Bible tells us that he perfectly kept God's law, something that a lot of proud people had tried to do for centuries, and by the way, still try, but no one ever succeeds. But he did. So here he was an innocent man. He had no guilt, either by what he had done, he, he never was guilty of a sin of omission, and he always perfectly kept the law of his father. But here he is on a cross. How did he get here? Because like the sinner we've already talked about, he was being punished. Yet it's distinctly different. Because he was here on trumped up charges. He was innocent. In fact, as we've already said, he was taking someone else's place. Barabbas, an insurrection, should have been on that cross. Remember, Pilate released Barabbas to the crowd as they insisted that Jesus be crucified. So literally, he was in Barabbas' place, but you recognize also theologically he was in my place. and He was in your place. This is the reason we call him the Savior. For he bore the cost. He was innocent. The Bible tells us in Mark 10, 45, that he came to give his life as a ransom. This is how he died. He's dying not for his own sin, like the sinner, but he's dying for others' sins. And he's alone. The Bible tells us he was deserted by his friends. He's an object of judgment. And in the sense of God's judgment upon him, the Father's judgment, there is some sense in which he even feels a sense of separation. There was no ultimate separation. But he bore our guilt, and he cries out, remember? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not truly forsaken, yet that's the Savior on the cross. Where was he headed? Well, here's another aspect that's very different from the sinner. For one thing, we need to recognize that as death came, the Bible tells us that he was not a victim of death. The Bible says that he had authority, that he was the one who would lay his life down. So he who is the creator of all, he's the Lord of life, he's also the Lord over death, he was determining how this would play out. Always remember that. But indeed, he would experience physical death. And his destination, according to his very words to this other man on the other cross, was that he would be in the renewed presence with his Father. In John 17, he cries out to the Father, and he desires to experience that glory that he's known from eternity, that in one sense or another, that glory is hindered because of his incarnation and his life and his walk upon earth, and he anticipates that he will be back, his spirit will be back with his Father in glory. That's his destination, but that's not all. Because he's clearly taught that on the third day, he will come out of the tomb victorious over death. He will experience the first fruits of that same resurrection that we talked about a moment ago. That God would regenerate and recreate that earthly body. And it would be joined again to his spirit, his human nature and divine nature together. And he would experience resurrection. And ultimately, what we know in the Bible from all of the promises under the Old Covenant and all of the promises in the New Testament is that one day he will reign as the king of this earth. That's his destination. Quite different from the sinner. Quite different from the sinner. The sinner, a robber and a thief. The Savior, just a lowly rejected rabbi, but nevertheless the king of kings and Lord of Lords. But there were three crosses. There were going to be three corpses, three destinations. Because you not only have the sinner and you not only have the Savior, but believe it or not, you also have the saint. Oh, at first, he's another sinner. He's a criminal. He's a thief. He's a robber. The book of Mark tells us that initially he joined in the blasphemy against Jesus, but something happened. Where had he come from? Well, 
much the same as the sinner. He also was from the human race. He was fallen, and then he had freely chosen a life of rebellion and sin. By the way, you and I might not be insurrectionists, and we might not be criminals, but we all have chosen to go our own way. As the prophet Isaiah, we've heard him already this afternoon. But evidently, this third man on this third cross He had evidently seen something about Jesus, or he had heard Jesus, or he had heard others witness about Jesus. We don't know what. We wish we knew. But here he was on a cross. And like the sinner, unlike the Savior, like the sinner, he deserved what he was getting. And he acknowledges this. Did you notice? It's his own acknowledgement. Here on the cross, he repents He acknowledges his guilt. In verse 41, he says, We indeed are justly being crucified. And he also believed. He believed because he cries out in faith to Jesus, Israel's deliverer. He uses this term, Messiah or Christ. He believes that there's this deliverance that the Father has sent, and Jesus is the one who provides that deliverance. And so he cries out in faith, And he is made a saint by grace. So you have a sinner, you have a Savior, and the Savior delivers a sinner into literal sainthood. You recognize that. The the New Testament doesn't use the term saint for some kind of hyper-spiritual, unusual, miracle-working follower of Jesus In fact, we're working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians right now, and we see that that church that had all kinds of problems, what does the Bible call those members of that church? The Bible calls them saints. Because it's not an issue of your performance, it's an issue of who has saved you. And this sinner on the third cross becomes a saint. Because when we think about where he was headed, well, his immediate future... His body would end up in a pauper's grave, like the sinner's. But Jesus tells him specifically where his spirit will be. His immediate future is your soul and your spirit will be in the very presence of the Father with me, in my kingdom. That's his immediate future. And then there's the promise we know from Scripture, again, from the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we know that one day... That body, which right now is somewhere rotted far away in a pauper's grave in Palestine, that the Creator God who put everything into place by His creative power, remember by just speaking the words that the Creator God will resurrect that body miraculously, and it will be joined to His Spirit, which has been with the Savior now for 2,000 years, and He will live eternally in paradise awaiting a resurrection, not to eternal death, that was the sinner, but awaiting a resurrection to eternal life. Three crosses, three corpses, three destinations. And could I remind you that in the moment, if you had a snapshot or a screenshot of that moment of Skull Hill 2,000 years ago, outside Jerusalem, all three of them would have looked pretty much the same. You would not have been able to recognize that there were three different destinations for these men who were being tortured to death. The cosmic reality, though, even though they look precisely the same on the crosses, the cosmic reality is they could not be more distinct And you recognize that destination, we could really use the term destiny, that the destiny is determined by what you do about the man on the middle cross, what you do about the Savior. Will you remain proudly holding on to your independence? Will you refuse to admit your guilt and your need? Will you live your life saying, no one will rule over me? Will you pursue and define your own identity? Will you insist that you're good enough? If so, you will be 
in the same circumstances, the same destination, the same destiny as the sinner? Or are you willing to yield to and to trust in the Savior? Are you willing to say, like the saint ended up saying, we are dying justly, we deserve to be on the cross, but He has done nothing wrong. And I trust Him and His promises and His sacrifice to cover my guilt and to take me to the Father. Three crosses, three corpses, three destinations. A saint or a sinner, which are you? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the wonder of the cross. We are so forgetful, Father. We're so distracted. It is likely the case that most of us in this room, and perhaps even most who watch online today, that most of us have gone through that transition. We were once sinners, and now by your grace you have made us saints. But how easy it is for us to forget. How easily we are drawn away. How quickly we are distracted. And Father, this is an opportunity, services like this, worship like this, especially the opportunity to remember Jesus' body and his blood at your table. This is an opportunity for us to hit reset, to reevaluate, to remember once again that if we're anyone in this story, we're either that sinner. Or we're the saint. May we own our identity as Barabbas, that someone took our place. And may we live in light of it in a way that makes a difference. We need to remember such. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to remember. Help us to reflect. And as we await the celebration of the resurrection, help us to recognize the things that are most important. We pray these things in the name of that glorious Savior on the center cross. In His name we pray. Amen.